Everybody wants to see into the future, whether it's to find out whether or not we should take a certain job, figure out what's going to happen with a particular relationship, or maybe we just want to know if it's going to rain on Sunday. But despite all this interest in forecasting, most actual forecasts aren't very good. And even and moreover, they're also not very well analyzed. In the new book, Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction, Wharton professor Philip Tetlock looks into what makes people good forecasters and suggests how you can incorporate some of those techniques into your own life. Philip, thanks for being with us. Thank you, my pleasure. Now, thanks to people like Tom Friedman and Nate Silver, and I think also maybe to the rise of big data, there seems to be a lot of interest in forecasting. So I was really surprised to learn from your book that despite all this interest in forecasting and maybe interest in people who have fashioned themselves as forecasters, forecasting itself is not very well studied. It's not very well analyzed at all. I think that's fair to say. And um, it's pretty threatening to keep score of your forecasting accuracy. Um, you know, imagine you're a, a big shot pundit um, what incentive would you have to um, submit to a forecasting tournament in which you had to play on a level playing field against um, ordinary human beings? And the answer is not much because the best possible outcome you could obtain is to tie it. Uh, you're expected to win, so the best outcome is a tie. And um, there's a good chance, our research suggests, that you're not, you're not going to win. Now, the book is act was actually decades in the making. I mean, your research into this has stretched back for years, and you actually start the book, and in some ways, this all started with a dart-throwing chimp. Could you tell us a little bit about that story? And I know you had said in the book that people didn't exactly get the right takeaways out of that study, but I thought it was interesting to sort of show what happens when we try and test forecasting. Sure. Um, well, in, in our early work, which, which I'm going to reveal how old I am, uh, goes back into the mid-1980s, uh, we, we did use the metaphor of the dart-throwing chimp uh, to capture the idea, a baseline for performance, which is how, how much better can you do than chance? If, if you had a system that, were that was just generating forecasts by chance, um, how, how well would you do relative to that? And um, that actually is a baseline that some people can't beat. Um, now, they can't beat it for a lot of reasons. Sometimes the environment is just hopelessly difficult, right? So if you were trying to bet on a roulette wheel in Las Vegas, you're, you're not going to be able to do any better than a dart-throwing chimp. Um, but people sometimes fail to beat the dart-throwing chimp even in, in environments where there are predictable regularities that could be picked up if you were being astute enough. Now, in the book, you point out that a lot of people took away from that study that all predictions are bad, that forecasting is bad. but in fact, what you were pointing out really is that there's actually limits on predictability, that it's not all bad, it's just that it, there are limits on it. That, that's right. You, you don't want to be too hard on people because some environments really are, there's a lot of irreducible uncertainty in some environments. It's very difficult to, to bring it down below a certain point. Um, so it, it's, it's unfair to portray people as, um, as being dumb in some sense if they're failing to do something that's impossible. Uh, of course, we don't know what's impossible until we try, until we try in earnest. So you, ne you, don't, you don't discover what we, we call it the optimal forecasting frontier. You don't discover how good it's possible to become in a particular forecasting environment until you run forecasting tournaments, competitive tournaments, you plug in your best techniques for maximizing accuracy, and you see how good you can get. And that's essentially what we did in the forecasting tournaments with the U.S. government, uh, the one sponsored by the intelligence community, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, we, uh, these are forecasting tournaments that run between 2011 and 2015, involving tens of thousands of forecasters trying to predict about 500 questions posed by the intelligence community uh, over that period of time. And um, we found that some people could do quite a bit better than the dart-throwing chimp, and they could beat some more demanding baselines as well. Now, one of the interesting things in the book is, I mean, you talk a little bit about where you found these forecasters who were part of your study, which is called the Good Judgment Project. Can you talk a little bit about where you recruited these people from and then also how these tournaments actually took place? Like, what exactly were they called on to do and how did they do? Well, we were very opportunistic. Uh, we recruited forecasters um, by advertising through professional societies, by advertising through blogs. Um, a number of high-profile bloggers helped us to recruit forecasters, people like Tyler Cowan, uh, Nate Silver, various people were helpful in, in recruiting forecasters. Uh, plus, we knew quite a few people from the earlier work that I'd done on expert political judgment. So we were able to gather initially a group of um, several thousand, um, and we were able to build on that uh, in subsequent years. Uh, the questions... Um, 
you know, you have to be careful about making big generalizations about how good or bad people are as forecasters. Because um, as, as I mentioned before, you can make people look really bad mm -hmm. if you want to. You, you, you can pose just intractably difficult questions. Right, because that's or, a big part of it too. Or, or you can make people look really good. <clears throat> you, can, you can pose questions that aren't, aren't, aren't all that hard. Um, and so you, you, you want to be wary of research that does cherry picking. Um, uh, and and, and there, there are some aspects, some aspects of that in some, in some of the literature. Um, what we were looking for was a process of generating questions that wasn't rigged one way or the other. And the method we came up with was uh, generating questions uh, through the U.S. intelligence community. There, there were questions that people inside the U.S. intelligence community felt would be um, of national security interest and relevance and reasonably representative of the types of tasks that intelligence analysts are asked to do. Um, so these were questions, um, typically they um, ask people to see out into the future several months, uh, occasionally a bit longer, occasionally shorter. And uh, we scored the accuracy of their judgments uh, over time. Uh, we, we didn't have people make judgments one way or the other. It wasn't yes or no. Uh, we had people make judgments on what's called a probability scale, ranging from zero to one. And, um, we, we carefully computed accuracy over time. We identified some people who are really good at it. We called them super forecasters, and, put, and they were later assembled into super teams of super forecasters. Um, and they you know, dominated the tournament, tournament essentially, over the next, over the next four years. Um, but we, we did a number of other experiments as well, looking for techniques that could, could be used to improve accuracy, and we found some. And now these super forecasters, they really came from all walks of life. But one of the things you point out in the book is that what makes a good forecaster is really how you think. And can you talk a little bit about what do you mean by that and what are some of the unifying characteristics of super forecasters? Well, it, it, when you ask people in the political world who has good judgment, the answer typically is people who think like me. So liberals tend to think that liberals have good judgment and if you have good forecasting judgment and conservatives tend to think that they're better at it. Um, it, it turns out to be the case that, that uh, forecast, good forecast, forecasting accuracy is not very closely associated with, 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 with ideology. There's a slight tendency for people who are the super forecasters uh, to be uh, more moderate and, and less ideological. Um, but there, there are lots of super forecasters who have strong opinions. Uh, what distinguishes super forecasters is their ability to put aside their opinions, at least temporarily, and just focus on accuracy. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a very demanding exercise for people. Now, are there things you mentioned, and like at the end of the book, you have 10 commandments for super forecasters. And so I'm wondering now, with the super forecasters, are there ways to make even super forecasters better? Are there conditions or environments to make them, I guess, super, super forecasters? <laughs> super, super forecasters. Well, um, ev ev eventually, um, you're going to reach a point where you're not going to be able to get any better sure. because, the, as I mentioned, the, some envir the environment itself has some degree of irreducible uncertainty. So no matter how good you are, uh, you're, you're not, you're, you're not going to do a very good job probably predicting what the value of Google is going to be next week on the, on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, there, so there are some things that are very difficult to do, and um, it's not clear that the super forecast, you, even using super forecasters, is going to let you make appreciable headway on that. Um, but there are many things that are quite doable that we previously didn't think were doable, and uh, you, there's a lot of room for improving the accuracy of probability judgments on those things. Um, those are things like predicting uh, whether international conflicts are going to escalate or de-escalate, whether certain treaties are going to be signed or approved by le legislatures, um, what, 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 whether Greece is going to leave the Eurozone. So there are a lot of problems that you know, have relevance to financial markets, have relevance to business decisions, um, where there is potential for improving probability judgment, where we have shown that experimentally now in the IARPA tournament. Um, but where people typically don't, don't do that. People typically rely on vague verbiage forecasts. They, people say, well, I think it's possible, or this could happen, this might happen, it's likely. Um, those are terms that you know, are informative at some level, but they're not all that informative. Um, if, you, if I say that something could happen, for example, you know, Greece could leave the Eurozone by the end of 2017, what does that mean? It could, I, it could mean I think there's a probability of 1% or 99%. Uh, or, you know, we could be hit by an asteroid tomorrow. Right. Uh, we, I mean, we, anything you know, could happen. <laughs> the, the sun could rise tomorrow. Yeah, I know they're, they're, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, elastic word. So um, the, 
asking people to make crude quantitative judgments, which become progressively more refined over time, uh, is a very good way to uh, both keep score and get better at it. Now, I find it, I find it really I ironic in the book that, you know, we have all of these people in the world who have sort of fashioned themselves as pro professional forecasters. I mean, pundits on TV, they're really television personalities, media personalities. And it's almost some, and it seems like to do that job, it's almost kind of a cult of personality. You don't want to be proven wrong. You would never admit that you're wrong. You're just going to sort of keep kicking it down the road and say, no, it's going to happen. But what you find in the book is that super forecasters, one of the things that unites all of them, despite coming from all these walks of life, is that they're a lot, they're willing to be proven wrong or they are open to the idea. They're willing to sort of look at things, look at evidence and retread and pivot. And so I found that interesting. It was, it was a kind of ironic, and I know you tell a story in the book about foxes versus hedgehogs that was very interesting. Right. Um, well, yeah, the, the fox-hedgehog metaphor is, is drawn out of a, a surviving fragment of poetry from the Greek warrior poet Ar Archilochus 2,500 years ago, and scholars have puzzled over it for over the centuries. Uh, it, 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 it runs something like this, and of course, I don't know ancient Greek, so uh, well, I'm, I'm t taking it on faith. This is what it actually says. Um, the... the um, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Uh, now, <clears throat> you can think of hedgehogs in, in debates over political and economic issues as people who have a big ideological vision. Um, Tom Friedman might be animated by a vision of, say, globalization, the world is flat. Uh, libertarians are animated by the vision that free mar there are free market solutions for the vast majority of problems that, that beset us. Um, there are people on the left who see the need for major state intervention to um, re redress various inequities. Um, there, there, are, there, there are environmentalists who think that we're on, on the cusp of uh, an apocalypse of some sort. Um, and so you, you have people who are animated by a, a vision uh, and their forecasts are informed largely by that vision. Uh, whereas the foxes tend to be more eclectic. Uh, they kind of pick and choose their ideas from a variety of schools of thought. They might be a little bit environmentalist and a little bit libertarian. They might be a little bit uh, socialist and a little bit um, uh, hawkish on certain national security issues. They, 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 they blend things in unusual ways. Um, so, and they're harder to classify politically. Um, now, in the early work, we found that um, the foxes were more, who were more eclectic in their style of thinking were better forecasters than the hedgehogs. Um, and in the, the later work, we found uh, something similar. We found that people who scored high on psychological measures of active open-mindedness uh, and need for cognition, uh, those people who scored high on those personality variables uh, tended to do quite a bit better as forecasters. Now, it seemed to me then that what we would really want is for more foxes to be kind of these really prominent forecasters or these people that we're seeing on television, that we're seeing in the news. But, it, but then at the same time, it almost seems like their personalities are just not necessarily what we think of, like are at odds with what we think of when we think of a leader, when we think of someone who's always putting themselves out there. So how does that, what does that mean for trying to get more accurate forecasters? I mean, how do we get people to be to listen to the foxes when they might not be the sexiest or the most prominent or the mo the people that we want to look at all the time or listen to all the time. That's right. So what do, what do we do? Uh, that, that is a bit of a dilemma. Um, the, the fo uh, imagine you are uh, a producer for a major, major television show and you have a choice between someone who's going to come on the air and tell you that um, – um, something decisive and bold and interesting is going to say the Eurozone is going to melt down in the next two years or um, the Chinese economy is going to melt down or there's going to be a jihadist coup in Saudi Arabia. He's got, he's got a good, big, interesting story to tell and the person knows quite a bit and can mobilize a lot of reasons to support the, the doomster prediction, say, on Eurozone or China or, or Saudi Arabia, or a boomster prediction for that matter. It doesn't matter. But the person is charismatic and forceful and um, can generate a lot of reasons why he or she is right, uh, as opposed to someone who comes on and says, well, yeah, on the one hand, yeah, there's a, some, some danger the Eurozone is going to melt down. But on the other hand, there are these countervailing forces. And on balance, probably nothing dramatic is probably going to happen in the next year or so, but it's possible that this could work. So um, who, who make, what makes better television? Um, to ask the question is to answer it. Uh, so there is, a there is a preference for, 
for hedgehogs in part because hedgehogs generate better sound bites. Uh, and people who generate better sound bites generate better media ratings, and that is what people get promoted on in the, um, in the media business. Um, so there is a bit of a perverse inverse relationship between, how, uh, between having the skills that go into being a good forecaster and having the skills that going, go into being a, an effective media presence. Now, how, how does this come into play, though, I mean, sort of in the world that maybe those of us who are not hiring forecasters on a regular basis don't see? So if I'm a company or the government and I'm trying to assemble a team of good forecasters or get good, accurate, or as accurate as possible forecasts, what can I take from this book? I mean, in terms of finding these people and employing these people, and is that happening now? Or is it the same as what maybe what we're seeing on CNN or Fox News? <laughs> I, well, I think a lot of organizations in both the private and the public sector are taking an increasing interest in forecasting tournaments and using them as methods of keeping score on how accurate their, their, their forecasting methods are, their, their people and their methods and their teams. Uh, there's a growing interest also in using forecasting tournaments to identify people who are better at it, it you know, develop your own core of super forecasters. Uh, there's growing interest in uh, uh, exploring methods of training people to be better forecasters. So I think this is going on. Um, I probably shouldn't mention the names of any organizations who have adopted this right now, but the U.S. intelligence community obviously has taken an active interest in, in, in this area, and, I, and some private sector organizations have as well. Now, it was interesting to me that, um, so you were discussing, a lot of the book talks about a little bit about framing. So it's not just about finding people who can make good forecasts, but it's also a lot about, you know, finding the right questions, finding the right way to frame the problem, breaking down a big problem into smaller little clusters. I mean, it, there's so much that goes into forecasting other than the actual forecast that comes out of it. And I wonder that do people, even are people thinking enough about those things as well, in addition to finding people who give good forecasts? I see that as one of the big objectives of the next generation of forecasting tournaments, uh, to focus on um, generating not just good answers, but good questions. Um, in the book, we talk about uh, the, the parable of Tom Friedman and Bill Flack. Tom Friedman is, of course, a famous New York Times columnist, Pulitzer Prize winner, who uh, is a you know, regular at Davos in the White House and circulates in, in, in networks of power. Uh, Bill Flack is an anonymous um, uh, retired hydrologist in Nebraska who also is a super forecaster. And we know a huge amount about Bill Flack's forecasting track record because he answered a very large number of questions in the course of the tournament and demonstrated he could do so effectively. But we know virtually nothing about Tom Friedman's forecasting track record, uh, notwithstanding that he's written a great deal over the last 35 years. And he, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a powerful analyst and a writer, and, and he does many things very well. But there's no way really to reconstruct with any degree of certainty, uh, reasonable certainty, uh, how good a forecaster he is. And Tom Friedman has detractors, he has admirers. His, 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 his admirers might say, well, he was right about you know, that it was a bad idea to expand NATO eastward because it would provoke nationalist backlash in Russia. Or he was, um, or he was wrong about Iraq uh, because he supported the 2003 invasion. Um, uh, people have a lot of opinions about those things. Um, now, Here's what we, when we, we, we did a careful analysis of Tom Friedman's columns, and one of the things we noticed is even though it's very difficult to discern whether or not he's a good forecaster, you know, going back after the fact, um, it is possible to, to, to detect some really good questions. He's a, he's a pretty darn good question generator. Uh, and we've actually begun to insert some of his, um, uh, his, his ideas for questions they're, they're, they tend to be rather open-ended. Uh, we, we've managed to translate some of them into uh, future forecasting tournaments. Uh, so let me give you an example from the past that, that illustrates the tension between being a super question generator and a super forecaster. So in 2000, late 2002, early 2003, before the Iraq invasion, Tom Friedman wrote uh, what I thought was a really quite brilliant column on, on Iraq in which he posed the following question, which, which, which really cut to the essence of a, a key issue in, in deciding whether to go into Iraq. He, he asked, uh, is Iraq the way it is today because Saddam Hussein is the way he is, or is Saddam Hussein the way he is because Iraq is the way it is? The chicken and the egg. The chicken and the egg. Um, and what, what, what would happen if you, if you took away Saddam Hussein? Uh, would, would, would the country disintegrate into a war of all against all? Uh, or would it m move toward, would it become a Jeffersonian liberal democracy in the next 15 or 20 years? Um, now, 
yeah, maybe, maybe not that, maybe not quite that fast, but in the, in that direction, things 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 would move in that would would move in that direction. Um, so Tom Friedman didn't know the answer to that question. Um, many people think he made a big mistake in supporting the invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, but he was shrewd enough to pose the right question. And if we'd been running forecasting tournaments in late 2002, early 2003, that would have been something we would have wanted very much to include in, 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 in that exercise. Um, and uh, so I, I think the, way, the right way to think about Tom Friedman and Bill Flack is that, you know, that, is that they, they have, they're complementary. Um, and that Tom Friedman's greatest contribution to forecasting tournaments may well be uh, the, his perspicacity in generating uh, uh, incisive questions. Um, he may be a good forecaster too, but we just don't know that yet. Right, but we need, in order, but good forecasting, we need the Tom Friedman's in the world and the Bill Flax. So to me, it would seem it's just a question of trying to get them together in the right ways and the right permutations to get the best, better, to get better predictions. That's where we come around in the book. It's not really Tom versus Bill, it's Tom and Bill. It, it should be symbiotic. Right. And now to get a little back to, I mentioned big data at the beginning. Now in the age of supercomputers and machine learning, and we're saying we can enter this into anything and get these answers back to us. I mean, what do you think, how do you think the role of human forecasting is going to change? I mean, how do these, how do using computers, using data, how does that complement or even compete with human forecasting? Well, in, in the book, we conducted an interview with um, uh, David Ferrucci, who was, uh, as, when he was an IBM scientist, he was responsible for developing uh, a famous computer program known as Watson, which defeated the best human Jeopardy players. Uh, and we, we asked him a number of questions about his views about the, the hu human machine forecasting. And uh, one question, well, one, li one line of questioning was particularly interesting, I think. It, it was... It, we, it, was, it was very clear to him and, uh, that it would be possible for um, a system like Watson to answer the following question reasonably readily. Uh, which two Russian leaders traded jobs in the last five years? Uh, that question, w Watson could search his historical database. It could figure it out. Um, reframe the question as, will those Russian, same Russian leaders change jobs in the next five years? Would Watson have any capacity to answer a question like that? And, and his answer was no. And the question was, well, how difficult would it be to reconfigure Watson so that it could answer a question like that? And his answer was massively difficult. <laughs> uh, it would not be something that would be easy to accomplish any time in, in the near future. Um, I think that's probably true. Um, I'm not an expert in that area, but he obviously is. Um, but I, when, I, when I think about what would be required, what, what's required to do the sorts of things that super forecasters collectively do. Uh, it's, uh, the amount of guesswork, the amount of informed guesswork that goes into constructing a forecast, a reasonable forecast. Um, it's difficult for me to imagine existing AI, artificial intelligence systems, uh, doing that um, in, in, the, in the near term. So now, if now reading the book, I mean, most people, luckily, will probably not be asked to answer big questions about Iraq, big questions about Korea, or any of some of the other things that you talk about in the book. But if someone is reading the book, and just to become a better forecaster about their daily lives, I mean, what, what do you hope that people take away from that to kind of apply it to the everyday, to the things they're going through, whether it's jobs, relationships, or even rain on Sunday? Right, right. Well, um, I think a lot of people spend quite a bit of money uh, on uh, advice uh, about the future that probably isn't worth the amount of money they're spending on it. Um, and they don't really know, they, they have no way of knowing that because they have no way of knowing the track record to the people whose advice they're, they're, they're seeking. The, most, the, mo the best example of that is probably in, in the domain of finance, um, where a lot of money changes hands. Uh, it's, it's directed to people who claim to have some ability to predict the course of financial markets. Uh, that is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible uh, or that nobody can do it with uh, any better than the dart-throwing chimp, um, but it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. So I, I think if people were more skeptical about uh, the people to whom they turn for advice, 
uh, about possible futures. Uh, I think finance would be a case in point. But I, I think more generally they should be very skeptical of the pundits they read and the, and the claims that politicians and other people make about the future as well. Um, it's very common for people to make bold claims about the future and offer no evidence for their track records. I would say it's almost universal. Um, right. So, great. And, and so, I guess if someone's making a bold claim, is that where we should? Is that the point where we should become suspicious? I guess. Well, the bolder the claim, uh, the more the burden of proof should fall on the person to demonstrate that he or she has a good track record. And it seems to me like it's often more the bolder the claim, the less likely someone's going to question that person sometimes. Well, that's a great point. That's a point about human psychology. Is we, we, we take our cues about whether somebody knows what he or she is talking about from how confident he or she seems to be. And the more confident, the more likely you're going to be able to blunderbust your way through the conversation. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a problem, and it suggests that people uh, need to think a little bit more carefully when they make appraisals of, uh, of competence and not rely as quite as heavily as they do on what we call the confidence heuristic. Um, it, is, it is true that confidence is, is somewhat correlated with accuracy, but it's, it's also possible for manipulative human beings to use that heuristic and um, turn us into money pumps. Philip, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>